Peace. All right, and we are live. Welcome to the Local Engineer Podcast. Tonight, we've got a video game engineer, Tony Barrett, here. He's in the Kennesaw, Georgia area. So this is a super, super interesting topic for me because I am a huge video game guy. Uh, even though I don't have time to play video games as much as I would like to. Um, so Tony recently came on the show for a full, uh, actually we did like a two hour podcast. If I'm, if I can, I remember we talked for a long time. Um, so we have a full production podcast coming out with him here in the next few weeks. So definitely you want to give that a listen, but I couldn't wait. I wanted to get you on here live. I wanted people to, to, be able to field you questions because as soon as I started telling people in my in like my friend circle that hey guy I got a video game engineer on the show everybody's eyes just popped they're like you got a what I didn't even know those were around here I thought those were only in Sweden and Dice or, or wherever right so right yeah um, <laughs> so let's give a quick background as to who you are and how you became a video game engineer yeah uh, so my name's Tony Barrett uh, I work as a, a game engineer and. I really, I just got my start by uh, playing video games, but also from doing things like playing music and uh, just learning how to program in high school. That led me to uh, KSU, which was Southern Poly at the time, where they actually had a game design degree. I ended up taking up that and uh, yeah, just been making games ever since. Nice. So uh, we had talked about, and we're going to do this all over again where I'm asking dumb questions because this stuff is a little more complicated than uh, I have the the vocabulary for. Like, I don't even know some ter some terms. I just don't know. You hear it all the time as a gamer. You hear the term unity. You hear engines uh, or video game engines. You hear, you know, frostbite, dice, EA, uh, who's a publisher, who's a producer, who's a, a, a who does what. Right. So. Let's get and you were we, before we went on air here this evening, we were talking about VR and how you that's what you've been tangled up with a lot lately. So, um, uh, yeah, for Christmas, I got my wife the uh Oculus Quest 2. Absolutely love this thing, this thing is fantastic. Um, she kicks my butt at Beat Saber, like, like I'm not even trying. Um, <laughs> and then my favorite game so far is. Uh, oh, geez. What's the... First off, the first one is the Star Wars Galaxy's Edge uh, game where you're actually like going through the ships and the the actual Galaxy's Edge. And if you've for all of you out there who've actually been to Disney World Florida with the Star Wars Galaxy's Edge area, if you haven't, first off, go. It's like the single handedly the best park I've ever been to. Regardless, it's not just a bunch of mice running around. It's like actually the coolest just immersive park I've ever been to, especially if you're a Star Wars fan, which I'm I'm a huge Star Wars guy. So to be able to go to Star Wars land or whatever they call it, Galaxy's Edge. And I'm walking around, you're in all of these different lines waiting for the uh, for the ride to get on. We rode the Millennium Falcon ride, which was a fantastic ride in the waiting room right before you go in. We got to sit in like the Millennium Falcon, uh, I guess, like the di like the just the wreck area, the iconic scene where they've got that checkerboard where they're playing that. I forget the name of the game, like the, with the hologram, uh, di like hologram aliens and stuff. So we're sitting there at this table and it's just like, holy crap, do they put a ton of effort into this park to make you feel like you're in the movie and then the game. And that's when I learned that there was a, and this was before Christmas that we went, uh, and someone had mentioned that, oh, yeah, they have this place in the VR game. And I was like, I, I this is before I even had the VR. So it was kind of a big goal of mine was I want to get VR and I want to play Star Wars. Let's see how this goes. Um, currently, I suck. About, I suck with a, a lightsaber. I'm not that good um, on the other games. Uh, but the the Galaxy's Edge VR is quite possibly my favorite VR game at the moment. Um, I've played Onward. Onward is a is a great game, very very technical. Um, also That's makes me the, nauseous. Um, the military sim one, right? <laughs> yes. So yeah, I mean you're actually able to like lean your head around corners and stuff. Uh, it's not like the regular you know keyboard mouse or uh, controller video games where you lean over and part of you is sticking out, but to your perspective you're not, and you just get blasted through a wall basically. Um, 
So sorry, I, that's that's my little rant with VR that I'm actually absolutely <laughs> love with it. I'm still trying to work up my tolerance to it. So I get I get motion sick easily apparently with it. Uh, shocker. I can do roller coasters, no problem. Uh, you put me in the back seat of like a minivan, fifteen minutes, I'm toast. And that's what this feels like. <laughs> it's so, funny because uh, it's it's actually the same thing. Uh, right. I think the term is simulator sickness. So like your inner ear and your eyes are getting conflicting info, and so your brain thinks, "Oh, I'm poisoned. I need to throw up." And so <laughs> that's what ends up happening. Apparently, you can train it out, but I don't see. I don't really get that super bad, so I've never really run into that. But I've got about a 15 minute limit. Uh, it, it, on onward, I can do about 15 minutes a piece and onward, but in the galaxy's edge, I can go for much longer. Um, because you're not as, you're not running around as much. It's the quick change of direction that, that really, you know, gets me. Oh, yeah. So, Oh, here we go. So, Oh, by the way, everybody. So if you're watching and you have any questions, please put them in the comments. I'm actively monitoring the comments right now. So right now we have little pine cone. Uh, has commented on the YouTube stream and has, here we go, I'll throw it up. So, uh, Tony, you can answer this one. Um, dude, this looks like a streamer. That's a night. Nice... Well, I, hmm. All right. We're going to look into this. Um, <laughs> how does cross... yeah, it is. It's really nice. Um, how does cross platform work with, for video games? That's actually an excellent question because I fundamentally never understood even when I was in high school, why I had to only play with people on Xbox and none of my friends on PlayStation could play the same dang game as I was. So can you go into this one? Can you take this one? Yeah, for sure. So usually from what I understand for cross-platform games, uh, the way it works is instead of it hosting all of the game data on either like a Sony or a Microsoft server, it's some third party, usually Amazon server that both consoles will connect to and it basically knows how to handle, oh, this is a, a PlayStation person, so I need to send them the right PlayStation info so Sony doesn't lock them out. Same thing with Microsoft. Um, usually, nowadays, the reason that cross-platform doesn't happen is more of a, of a business decision than a technical one. Although, I do remember this was probably mid to late 2000s. There was a Xbox 360 game that was uh, an FPS that they tried to do cross-platform specifically with PC and Xbox. And they had to scrap it because you just can get way more specific with your controls on PC than you can with controller. And so yeah. uh, everyone on Xbox was just already at a disadvantage. <laughs> yeah. So, um, so yeah, thank you. Little pine. Cone. That was a fantastic question. I love that. Um, so Going so continuing on with that as far as cross platform goes, yeah, I definitely see. I definitely thought for the longest time, um, and you're probably still on the money. That's what the current reason is: is pure business decision. We're going to keep all Xbox people in our environment. We're going to keep PlayStation people in our environment, and it's just a battle of the brands, basically. But lately, we've been seeing a lot of games that are becoming cross platform, uh, but not as much of the uh, what was it? Uh, what's the word? The the big, big flagship franchises like Call of Duty and Battlefield and stuff that only just recently were they becoming like truly cross platform um, across right. play, PlayStation, Xbox and PC all together. Um, and I believe the, the first one that at least I got into that that had that and was well done was uh, Call of Duty Warzone, which I was like, this is a great it's a one game mode. You know, I, I, I could totally understand what, like you were saying, uh, all the information basically has to be done, whichever platform it is, and they still all have to communicate with each other. Um, right. So one game mode, one game type, one map. I mean, I don't know how much easier it could really get as a controlled environment for code, but that's where you come in because I don't know anything about code when it comes to a video game. <laughs> well, so, this is where I'm also getting stretched thin a little bit because I don't know that much <laughs> about networking. <laughs> So I'm making a lot of assumptions oh. here. Oh, okay, so but that's I, different I feel than like the I'm actual also, game. Well, it, it is and it isn't. Uh, so I know I've, I've dabbled a little bit in some networking stuff. And for some things, yeah, it's going to work the same as if it was a single-player experience or even a local multiplayer experience. But gotcha. uh, 
you know, actually like sending data packets and making sure everything's synchronized. That's kind of where I usually fall off of it because it's not relevant to whatever work I'm currently doing. And I just don't have the time to learn it. So <laughs> that's, that's about where my knowledge ends on that. Gotcha. So uh, another thing. So I, first off, I don't know. I think we talked briefly about like what kind of games you were interested in, but are are you interested in the new Battlefield 20, 2042? I think it was, is coming out. That game, yeah. oh man, that's got my interest peaked. I'm just, my issue is I don't really have uh, the hardware right now to run it. I'm kind of disappointed about that because, yeah, <laughs> I haven't really been excited about a Battlefield game until, like, yeah, really until this one came out. Yeah, especially right now where, you know, GPUs are hard to get and the people you can buy them from are trying to scalp them for twice the msrp but hopefully that'll be coming to an end here soon so that i'm in the same boat um on my pc i've been running the same graphics cards now for about four or five years so (laughs) it's definitely time to update to the new 30 series so but i'm holding out i'm holding out for a 3070 that's happening (laughs) i'm not i'm not stepping down so especially what's so funny is is like the 3070s come out and they're what was it five hundred dollars or something or six hundred dollars so like super yeah. reasonable for how powerful they were but then you're seeing people still try to sell their 2080 ti's for like fifteen hundred dollars like guys this 3070 can run circles around yours and it's half the price of what yours was brand new no i'm not paying twice i just this whole used market man is just ridiculous to say the least so um oh right. here we go we got another question so here we go uh this is the second one it's another good one i like this um little pine cones asking what would cause a game to crash for multiple players i've always wondered this myself like what actually when you say a game crashes to us as the user right obviously we lose like, we lose everything it's out of the game boom it's just a hard reset so like, we know what the word crash means but what is actually happening in the background that's a good question, and it's unfortunately going to be one that's pretty specific to what game you're actually playing at the time. So usually a crash happens when just something that is unresolvable happens. So, uh, you know, the game is expecting, uh, you know, a certain value is like, oh, I'm expecting to get something between like zero and two back when I plug this formula in and it gets like three or it gets like the letter n and it's like okay i don't know what to do with this this doesn't really help anything else so we're just gonna like close down we don't know what to do um yeah thankfully a lot of uh programming styles nowadays uh usually error catching is built into it so if something like that happens it can recover gracefully but yeah if something causes multiple players to uh, have a game crash, especially in an online environment, usually it's something going on with the server that either it is like, it is run into something that it can't really resolve or someone just cut the uh, power on it or even uh, network connectivity in that specific area those people are playing in can just have some kind of adverse effect on it. Gotcha. So yeah, like you said, it's a it could be a multitude of things, right? So, and it's it's tough to pin down too, especially in a in a live environment. Right, right. So from from so one of the things that you just said to mitigate it is the you know auto recovery systems or, or, or parts of the program. Is that due to let's say let's say not it wasn't internet. Um, it was just you know let's. I don't know, I'll make up make up an example. Call of Duty Warzone. We're all mm-hmm. playing game crashes. And it crashes for everybody. What would most likely be the issue? Uh most likely it'd be something going on with the server. So your game gets some kind of bad signal back from the server that causes it to just close everything down. Gotcha. And usually in that case, your actual game, so what's in your uh um what's in your console or what's in your PC will know what to do and say, Hey, I got this signal back from the server. So we're just going to show everything down. We'll show an error message and then we'll kick them back to the main menu. Gotcha. Gotcha. Cool. So 
let's get into um so now let's get into uh like we uh, actually yeah we had just started to bring up battlefield 2042 so uh how excited for that are you and what are you most excited for with battlefield 2042 um i'm, I'm pretty excited for it this is like one of the few games that i actually have on my horizon right now i think it's like that in the new metroid game uh I think I'm most excited just to get into vehicles again, man. Like, I feel like I've been yeah. playing nothing but Call of Duty, which, you know, I'm not knocking Call of Duty, but I, I had a friend who went semi-pro with, I think, the first Black Ops when it came out. Oh, wow. And he, he was also, uh, I, he played at some professional level for paintball, and he told me, he's like, it's the same exact thing. I, I am doing the same exact things in paintball that I'm doing in Call of Duty. There's no difference. <laughs> I'm like, oh, that's fine. Ever since he told me that, I can't like unsee it whenever I play any Call of Duty now. It's like, yeah, this basically is just paintball. Okay. Yeah, this makes yeah. sense. Uh, I feel like Battlefield just has like a much more realistic feel. And that's what I really Agreed. like about it. That's I, so, yeah, I, the franchise I always fell in love that I fell in love with and was most loyal to was absolutely the Battlefield franchise. Uh, so, I actually got interested in games with Battlefield Bad Company, and I didn't know at the time that Bad Company was different than just the regular Battlefield. So I play the campaign. I liked the characters. They were hilarious. They were fun. Um, super technical uh, missions you had to go on. And then I got to Battlefield Bad Company 2, did that, and then Battlefield 3 comes out, and I assumed it was Bad Company 3. Didn't know that they had discontinued the Bad Company series. So I get Battlefield 3, and I'm like, whoa, this is it's like almost the same, but it's pretty different. Um, and then the, the, the rest is history. I played m the majority of Battlefield, to say the least. Um, I tried Call of Duty, but like you said, it felt like paintball, and uh, just it was the... It was arcade arcadish to me. I don't even know if that's a verb. I'm gonna make a word tonight, but it was I mean, more I've, of an I've arcade. I've heard it plenty of times. You're good. <laughs> um, and then, but Battlefield wasn't necessarily a simulator, right? I, I thought it was a simulator until I played Arma, and then I realized what a simulator actually is. That game is hardcore, difficult. That is not for like someone who wants to get in, pop in a game, and get out. So. Oh yeah, for uh, sure. Like, there's definitely a spectrum of like. You know, on one end, you have things like uh, like Fortnite or Apex Legends or Call of Duty, which I feel like this is going to be insulting to some people. It's really not, but uh, <laughs> it's it's more arcadey. The idea is you want to jump in, play like around, and jump out and have a good time. Yep. And then on the other end, we have stuff like Arma, where yeah, the main majority of what you're doing is just learning the systems and trying to get it as close to realistic as possible. I feel like Battlefield's right in the middle. And yeah. that's what I think I appreciate about it the most. I think that's a great explanation of it. It's right in the middle there. Um, and like you said, vehicles, absolute favorite thing. Why it took Call of Duty so many years to get vehicles in multiplayer was beyond me. But I mean, again, you can't throw a, a car game. and paintball. Like... So you think they have paintball fields actually all around that have uh, the little, like, they basically take golf carts and they turn them into tanks. So oh, wait, you have some awesome, actually. Yeah. <laughs> they, they put you up in this like turret and you're, I mean, it's a, you're still using a paintball gun. So you're not like, you don't have like a j actual like tank cannon shooting paint or anything, but you're driving like an actual armored vehicle running around. Uh, but your driver can get hit. Your driver gets hit. Your vehicle's dead where it is. <laughs> so, oh, no. <laughs> um, it's, there, there are a lot of paintball places that are trying to make it interesting. Same thing with Airsoft, and that's always what I've heard. Call of Duty is paintball, as to Battlefield is Airsoft, which is you know more of that military simulation versus arcade games. So, um, Oh, and, and here's one right in the middle. I was never a huge Halo fan, because I felt that one was just way too arcade game for me. Um, mm -hmm. so Pinecone's asking who is hype for Halo Infinite? I don't even know about this. I don't keep up with Halo, period. I'm actually I'm I'm pretty hyped for it. Uh so I played a lot of Halo back in high school. And uh it, it definitely falls into um more of the arcadey area of like shooters. In fact, Halo is uh 
an older version of like FPS, like multiplayer games called arena shooters. So things like hmm. Quake and um, Lord, I'm like struggling for a second example because Halo has really <laughs> just dominated that space for so long. Uh, but yeah, like it, it's just, it's a different feel. I, I would say that Halo isn't really like paintball. Halo is really like, it's just its own thing. Um, right. I'm actually really excited for this new one. I haven't played one since, uh, I don't think I ever played four or five. I just didn't have the time to when they came out. And uh, I've been trying to find a Series X like specifically to play this. But uh, if that falls through, uh, I can always go on Game Pass and just play on my computer. So, Yeah, here we go. We got another one. Uh, I love this. Everybody keep throwing questions in. This is fantastic. This is going to help. Uh, this is going to help me ask him more, in- or I should point this way, uh, more oh, interesting yeah. things. <laughs> um, here, uh, Austin S. asks, when do you think full cross-platform multiplayers will become a thing? Yeah, so he's kind of coming on the tail end of that of when will it become a thing? When will they get past Xbox players will stay with Xbox? It's so funny. It's like both Xbox and PlayStation will will play with PCers, but when are we going to get all three on everything? Like, when will this just become a, a standard? Like, because well, at the end of the day, it, and tell me, and totally push me in the right direction if I'm thinking about this wrong. The PlayStation versus the Xbox, it's just a, it's, what, what controller do you like at that point? It really doesn't, nobody's, nobody's breaking open these consoles like people are breaking open a, a PC. Oh, I'm putting more RAM in. Oh, I'm putting in water cooling. Oh, I'm putting in a, you know, a huge 3080. Yeah, nvidia card you know you're not no one's doing any upgrades so right. both of these consoles are maxed out because you can't upgrade them so at the end of the day i think you're you're finally running into hey people are going to just stick to the brand that they're loyal to you know people who've been i've been xbox my whole family's been xbox we were never playstation we had them i never played it i hate i did not like the controller i just i didn't like the feeling of it the xbox controller was my preference so, right. but because of that, I couldn't play with all my buddies who had PlayStation. So, yeah, when do you think, as a guy in the industry, when do you think the cross-platform will just become a universal, you know, standard? Uh, I mean, I don't want to be pessimistic here, but there's a good part of me that says I don't think it's ever going to happen because... Oh, no. <laughs> it's very much a brand thing. I, I think uh, certain companies... Uh, really want people connected into their ecosystem and they don't want them to you know consider the possibility like oh i could play this on something else it's like no we we want you to stay over here like (laughs) keep playing our stuff don't ever go don't ever look over there (laughs) so yeah i unfortunately i just don't think it's ever going to happen or it's never going to happen completely so we might hit a case where 90% 90% of games are fully cross-platform. They work on, you know, PlayStation, they work PC, Xbox, Switch, hell, even mobile. I've, I've run into some games that play on mobile, PC, PlayStation 4 already. But um, having everything work together seamlessly, I I just don't think it's ever going to happen. <laughs> Unless, like, something <laughs> crazy happens and, you know, some some stu- some studio or some company bigger than every other big studio just comes and just incorporates all of them into one brand. Gotcha. Yeah. Awesome. Well, Austin, I don't know if you liked that answer, but I kind of <laughs> yeah. <laughs> realize that's not, it's not a great answer. I can't uh, give you a release date. I, Cause I don't think it's ever right? going to happen. <laughs> so, so let's get into, um, let's get into the games that you develop as a game design engineer and specifically you use the unity engine, right? Right. So let's, so, let's yeah, go take it away. Yeah, sure. Uh, so just to give a quick rundown on what I'm currently working, uh, well, what I'm currently doing in my uh, current job is uh, I work at a hyper casual mobile game studio. So, that word basically hyper right hyper yeah casual hyper casual <laughs> what does that mean <laughs> so you have your casual stuff and then we make it hyper now <laughs> uh so you can think of a casual game as something that is it's a lot like an arcade kind of game where 
you can pick it up. It's very easy to understand, very easy to get into. And you're typically only playing for maybe 10 to 15 minutes. And the idea is that you play it, you know, maybe once or twice a day. Hyper casual is that, but distilled down even further. So typically there's only one or two main mechanics. And the idea is that you're really not going to play this for more than five minutes at a time. So something where you're in a, the doctor's office waiting for your appointment, or really you're just waiting around waiting for something to happen and you don't have enough time to pull a book out or, you know, even pull something like your switch out to start playing something. So gotcha. that's sort of the, the niche we're trying to fill with that. And the company you're at is? Uh, it's Tasty Pill. Uh, I love that name. Right. I really do. You know, it's it's a unique one for sure. Uh, I've worked at a couple companies that have very tech sounding names. This was the first one where it's like, this might be a, a pharmaceutical company, actually. I don't know why they need game developers here. <laughs> Oh, I love it though. I love, it. I love, I love hearing the just fun, you know, it is, it's a game company. You're designing things to have fun with. And I, and I love that. I really do. So with the unity engine, so I'm aware of the engine only because believe it or not, uh, once you and I uh, connected a few weeks ago to get you on a podcast and then to come on and do some live streams was I had a, uh, advertisements popping up on facebook believe it or not for the unity engine and it had uh it had some like cnc machines and they were showing how that you know the unity engine is being used to train uh workshop employee like, uh, they're they're sorry let me get my words together here it's all good. They're using the Unity engine to develop training simulation esque games that will actually train somebody to learn how to use like machine shop equipment without actually having to actually touch it. So, uh, can you quickly explain what is a game engine and then explain the difference between Unity and like another one? I really don't even know of like another engine. I probably have heard the name, but I don't know. I, I don't consciously know of another engine. No, you're all good. Uh, so to keep it as simple as possible for uh, you know, just anyone listening, uh, Game Engine is just going to be, well, there could be others. You never know. <laughs> we are we are alive right now. Uh, but no, so a, a Game Engine you can think of as just uh, a collection of different uh, just systems. So things like like a physics system, uh, an audio system, a, an actual graphics system, just already packaged together into one cohesive thing. You know all these things work together, they play well together. And so you don't have to worry about building all of that separately now. You can just focus on putting them together in interesting ways to make a fun game. And uh, currently I work in Unity, Alts, but uh, in the past I've dabbled a little bit in the Unreal Engine, which uh, I know that's the main competitor to Unity, but I've also done stuff oh, in Game Maker okay. Studio, and uh, I've done a little bit of stuff in Godot as well. Godot's super tiny. I think they've probably been on the market for two or three years at this point. Oh, and wow. everyone I know who uses it swears it is the best thing ever, but I think it's it's like the PBR of game engines right now, in my opinion. <laughs> <laughs> it's like not a lot of people are into it, but the people who are are just kind of snobby about it, which, yeah. hey, maybe maybe there's something to it. I, I don't know. <laughs> I haven't had the chance to look at it yet. Oh, that's funny. So what all do you do in Unity? Oh, that's a big question. Uh, oh. As far as, like, day-to-day -day or, like, like uh, what I guess kind of you, you, make? you guide that. So, again, coming from somebody that I, I just know, I know of Unity, Engine, You've now explained to me in general terms what an engine is, um, mm -hmm. but what do you, what specific, like, what can you, like you said, like the physics aspect, right? So right. Uh, an example of one of the physics aspects would be uh, like a flight simulator game, right? You've got the physics of your plane traveling through the, like, actually flying, right? That's all, that's all physics. It's some luck, but it's mostly physics. Um, <laughs> <laughs> um and then you have, you know, your first person shooter games, you actually have the realistic games have ballistics like where, you know, that little tiny rock is a projectile that has to 
curve and whatnot. And then other games like Call of Duty, you can take a as the that was probably the most infuriating thing to me with Call of Duty was you would take the most inaccurate thing and then just make a laser beam shot from entirely across the map. And I'm like, that's not how this works. That's not how any of this works. These oh, yeah. things have like like the like most most handguns like the nine millimeter caliber. Um, so I got so frustrated. I went and did the math on this. Cause I, I, I'm, I actually built, I actually programmed myself my own ballistic calculator in MATLAB. Mm-hmm. That it's another level of nerd. And I, so I've been told, but um, I wanted to be able to just magically type in and like, ju- and just keep it basic. Um, of course, every elevation you shoot at would be a different result and different weather conditions. I know that, but um what was it? I think like 300 yards, a 300 yard shot with nine millimeter was like a, thir- you would have to hold. O- you So like holding over is you're aiming higher than mm-hmm. w- where you are actually intending to hit. Cause you know, your projectile is just a little ball, right? It has to, it will rise and fall. You have to hold over about 13 feet to get it to land at the target at 300 yards. Or, or whatever it was, which it doesn't seem like much. A little, a tiny like fraction of a degree can yield a 13 foot height difference, and why? So I, kn- me knowing this and playing Call of Duty and seeing somebody laser beam me from the entirely other side of the map, just, ugh, it, <laughs> it just got me. Well, and that's but actually that's an what... interesting like avenue we can go down for uh, just game design in general, where it's because yeah, uh, it. this was an, an issue uh, I remember playing uh call of duty with my dad um you know back in high school and i would do the thing where like i have a full magazine i shoot two shots and then i hit reload and he's like what are you doing there's like 14 (laughs) rounds left in that magazine you just dumped it i'm like no it's okay because like it only took two off of my total ammunition oh that's not how this would work uh A lot of game design is is about abstraction. So a lot of these systems that you're putting together aren't going to be one to one with what is actually like true to life. So for the example you're saying with like the laser beam stuff, the uh, the term used for that type of uh, interaction in a game is called hit scan. So essentially what you're doing is the game gets a a signal saying, Hey, this person pulled the trigger on their gun. What it does is it literally shoots like a little laser beam out from the barrel of the gun or from wherever they're going to decide to score it. And they just check to see if it hits somewhere. It's like, did it hit a person? It's like, okay, cool. Uh, Send some damage their way. And that's it. No, no actual bullet is ever fired from the gun. It's, it's literally just smoke and mirrors at that point. Huh? But going back to like uh, what we were saying about Battlefield, I know uh, at least back when I played Battlefield with like Battlefield 3 and 4, they did projectile base. So if you shot a, uh, a gun, there was a physical bullet in the game that was being tracked, which. Oh, wow. Yeah, which is crazy. I don't know if it was specifically just for things like snipers or if it was for all weapons. I, I never yeah, bothered I to do check. know. I do. I, I do remember. Like the, the, there actually was a delay. There was not just on my end, click, and then on your end, you're hit. It was I would, you know, I would fire, and it, you could literally, if especially when you were really far away, like in, oh, well, oh my goodness, all my buddies are gonna get mad at me if I don't remember the exact name of the map. It was like Sinai Desert or something. You'd be on the oh, opposite yeah. end of the desert, and you'd take a shot, and I mean, you could count to like two, three four and then your round would hit the sand and if the guy is just walking and you didn't lead the shot properly it would it would land somewhere else like you actually could get away because the physics were real and that was like the most amazing thing or if you saw somebody's if you saw the muzzle flash you had a second to like duck back in the door if you were lucky enough um oh yeah because that bullet physically had not gotten to you yet and again, this well, is at very get, great um, distances. You'd also get like scope flare too, where it's the like glint, if someone yeah. was just looking at you with a scope and you'd get that flash. It's like, oh, I need to go back inside. This isn't good. <laughs> right. I need to find a different door here. <laughs> yeah. It's like, I hope whoever's next to that guy doesn't have uh, anything that can <laughs> blow this wall open. 
I love it. And 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 like you like we were saying, those the physics aspect of Battlefield games in particular was the sole reason why that was my favorite uh series. So um when it comes to having a game that is realistic, and then we get into more like the, the I would call them simulator games like your racing sims, um, your flight <laughs> sims and whatnot. Um how difficult are those to actually to 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 program i should say is it you have a team work on like all the physics aspects of and it's like a library you just pull from or are you having to so i don't even just i just don't even know i don't understand how like how does this all go together man i i have very basic arduino capabilities and some plc (laughs) programming capabilities here so the, right. the, the game industry is just it's mesmerizing to me what you what you do well hey i appreciate that uh as far as like simulator games yeah you're gonna have like a whole like team dedicated to probably not even just like physics in general but let's say um flight simulator just for the sake of an example you would have an entire team probably just related to okay here is how like clouds are going to like organically be formed in the atmosphere when you're playing here's what they're going to do to um change just not even like the plane when you fly through it but just changing the air pressure and then we're going to let when the plane fly when the plane flies through we're going to let it figure out what it needs to do based on like the air pressure changing and whatnot so gotcha gotcha. yeah it, it especially for simulator games usually the the main focus is going to be we're highlighting like a very specific very realistic system that people are going to play with and so for that you're going to have a lot of time dedicated to that so people are going to get as granular as they can with it gotcha gotcha that's awesome i mean that really is just uh and so and on average so i know most of these games, especially especially like Call of Duty, they typically have like an annual release or every like biannual release. I remember what was it? There was like two major uh, producing companies, and, cor- and and correct me if I'm wrong with the terminology here. Just jump all over me. Um, what was it? Tre- Treyarch? E, I'm going off of memory here. It's like Treyarch was yeah. one, and then Infinity Infinity Ward was another. What were those? What were those two entities? What what are they called? I know they're not game engines, but like, what are those entities? So those are actually um, development companies. Uh, I know for Call of Duty, it was Treyarch and Infinity War for a while. I think with Call of Duty Ghosts, they introduced Sledgehammer games as well. So there's really three separate companies. And uh, essentially the reason they do it that way where, you know, how can three companies still uh, make a game and call it Call of Duty? Um, it, it's because, you know, the publisher, uh, I was about to say EA, that's not right. Uh, Activision, <laughs> uh, they own call of duty, uh, like the intellectual property, the branding, all of that is theirs. What gotcha. they're doing is they're getting sledgehammer infinity war Treyarch to basically license out that, uh, that IP and they can make a call of duty game. And the reason you can get one every year is because, well, it takes about two or three years to make one. But if you have three companies just working on their own and it's staggered, you get one a year. Gotcha. That makes perfect sense. Because that was all that was going to that's now my follow up question is, is about every year we got a new Call of Duty, about every two years or even longer, we would get a new Battlefield. So mm-hmm. but every time the Battlefield game would come out, it would just blow away the call of duty game every single time. And then it was this competition of like who, like the storyline or the timeline of the game. Right. So word came out that called or that battlefield was doing a world war two game. And then call of duty was like out of thin air. Oh, Hey, we got a, we got a world war two, uh, a new world war two call of duty coming out. Right. Um, so it, it, that may, that answers that question that they've got essentially three companies producing the game. 24 <laughs> seven. Mm-hmm. So. Um, well, and that's, that's something too, like where, cause I I've actually seen this happen a couple times in the past couple of years where it seems like 
a game is almost made in response, but it has such, like if the release window between these two games are so close, it's like, no, these were both just thought of separately and they just happen to be so close to each other. Granted, oh, World wow. War II is like a huge topic and I get why both of them decided to do that when they did because for the longest time we had like five, six years of either uh, futuristic combat or modern combat. Exactly. So it's like, let's go back to World War II where like all this FPS, like military sim stuff started because the first right. battlefield was supposed to be... Uh, you know, all the uh, the Pacific Island uh, theater, like, warfare. So it was like, everything, like, in, like, 1940s. Yeah. I actually... Oh, this will be a test. Um, a, an old... They actually... Uh, what was it? EA just finally, unfortunately, pulled the plug on all the servers. Because we were talking about retro video games off-air before. Like, what kind of game... Like, that seems... Uh, that is one of your genres that you're currently into right now, is some of these retro games. I say retro as in like not the major franchise games. Um, like, uh, like I think you were saying Pokemon was one. So I would call that like a retro just like topic, I guess. Um, there was a retro EA game called Battlefield Friends. I believe it was. Um, or uh, No, sorry. That's the YouTube channel. Um, which, by the way, if you haven't seen them, they're hilarious. Um, <laughs> yeah, I'm just going to go ahead and add a bookmark real quick. <laughs> uh, yeah. Oh, we're gonna. So yeah, the uh, that is not suitable for for uh, for children. I would say they swear a lot, but um, they are hilarious animations of like what happens in the game as a player. So it's really really funny. But but no, yeah, EA made this. Man, I'm really I'm really stretching my memory here. But this is the game that we all played. Uh, this is when I was believe it or not, I was a, I was a PC or before. I, I think I had an Xbox. Mm -hmm. um, I remember, I remember having to have my mom sign in on the computer in the dining room or, or wherever it was in the office, and I would watch this little box load basically to connect to the internet. I remember the sound and everything. I forget what it was called, but um, oh, like and then I would, one? yeah, yeah, yeah. I remember that. <laughs> uh, it was a that was a long time ago. Um, oh yeah. But I remember I remember going waiting for that to happen to get online. And there was this old World War II EA game, super cartoonish. It was supposed to be cartoonish. And you had these characters and you could it was the it was like not necessarily like the loot crate stuff, but the same concept of you can buy different pieces of the uniform. You could buy different uh, like gun skins. You could buy different plane skins and all this stuff. And that game was uh that game was just like single-handedly the most fun game ever you could hop in and it, and it had planes it had tanks this was like 10 years ago 12 years ago yeah, playing a pc game with all these with all the stuff in it before i even heard of battlefield on an xbox right um, yeah so i'll i'll have to find it but i i read an article recently it was actually from i read an article and then saw a jack frags video on it saying that ea had just pulled the plug on the servers that were hosting that game finally after 10 or 12 years of the game um man it's bothering me i can't remember it anyway we'll move on uh, That's I was all gonna good. Say <laughs> so um so when it comes to so let's get into what you find the most interesting as the, obviously this is your day job you know game design engineering what is the most interesting thing in gaming happening today uh, that's, that's a good question. And it's, it's funny because if I feel like there's multiple things going on, um, I think design wise, uh, in the past couple of years, especially with games like, uh, breath of the wild and, um, even like the, the newer Assassin's Creed games coming out, there's a rise in what's called a uh, systemic games. So instead of having things like just be like discrete levels where, you know, you're going through and you're essentially you're just doing challenges until you beat the level and you go to the next one. You have all these interlocking systems that are kind of playing together. And then you as the player are just presented with not even challenges, but just situations. It's like, okay, how do you handle this situation? It's gotcha. like, well, 
I have like four guys that are running at me, but we're in grass. I know grass burns, so I'm just going to burn the grass and they'll catch on fire. <laughs> Which you do that and you're like, wait, I also catch on fire. I'm on fire now. <laughs> but uh, I think that's that's something interesting I've seen that I think is going to be bigger in uh, at least the design sense of it. I think as far as technology, I mean, uh, VR is going to be huge. I. I feel like I've been saying that for years, but I, I still think it is. It's gotten bigger than when it debuted, what was it, four or five years ago, really? When, like, consumer-grade yeah. VR was, like, actually viable. Um, I think the standalone oh, yeah. stuff, like the Quest, that's that's going to be a game-changer. Yeah, because the fact I remember... that I didn't have to have wires was the biggest kicker exactly. for it. And, and a price tag, with the, with the market going crazy this past holiday season, it was 300 bucks. Yeah. I couldn't even touch the other corded ones like a couple of years ago. They were like fifteen hundred dollars. Oh, and yeah. you still had to have like a two, three thousand dollar PC with enough power to be able to power the VR. It was like this is just a whole nother but obviously, you know, technology spikes and then plateaus, right? So I I think I agree with you a hundred percent that you know, give it a couple more years at most. In VR is going to be like a regular household thing. And it's not the. I got really turned off by VR when it first came out because you either had the $1,500, like I think it was like the the HTC vibes or or, or whatever. I may yeah. be butchering this. No, you got um, it. But the ones that they actually had a ton of power, right? They could actually do some incredible stuff. But um, the other, ver you either were $1,500 or you had like the Google lens thing, which was like a cardboard box with your phone in the box and it was yep. vr i i was i was not a fan of that i was like uh <laughs> it was just you could call it virtual reality but it's a cardboard box taped to your face great yeah so i think google go. was really doing that just to like get that more just in people's heads like oh hey vr is a thing now because really things like the quest I mean, it's running like cell phone hardware already. So essentially, that is what it is. It's it's just a phone doing VR. But, you know, phone hardware has just surpassed itself so many times over in the past couple yeah. of years that, yeah, now that's actually way more viable. Here we go. We got a question from the audience. We got Little Pinecone here again. Uh, have you heard of a game that has one VR player versus five PC players? Now that's interesting. I have not heard of this. Is I this haven't heard of anything for PC. This kind of like asymmetrical like gameplay I, is something I've always really liked. It's like let's go into that. What is that. So asymmetrical just means that everyone playing it doesn't necessarily play the same way. If that makes sense. So mm -hmm. so I've I've seen something like this before, uh, but it was with PlayStation VR where I think it was like one of the demo games they like gave with the headset, if I remember correctly, where the person with the headset was supposed to play a cat and uh, everyone with controllers were mice. And the idea was that a curtain would be drawn around the cat. Cat can't see where the mice are hiding. And then when the curtain gets drawn, the cat's actually like looking around. Well, the person playing the cat is looking around, picking up cups and stuff to see like where people hid. Meanwhile, everyone else is just sitting there next to them with their controllers, just figuring out like, all right, what are we going to do? He can't see us. So we can like, we can at least like <laughs> pantomime something to get out of here. Um, that actually sounds like a really fun game. Yeah. See, I, I feel like it's good in the context of, of like a party game, something where like, yeah. you're going to bring a lot of people over and play that way. I don't, I don't know if you can really make it or extend it beyond that. I would love to see someone try that. I mean, hell, I might try that. I don't know. But um, <laughs> yeah, I, 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 I just really feel like that's something that's good for like party games, but I, I just don't see it working anything like larger than that. I mean, you could do right. something like, um, did you ever play Evolve? Uh, it came back no. in like 2013, 2014. That had a similar mm -hmm. concept where, uh, one person played like a big monster and then everyone else played like hunters. So, like maybe you could do something like that where the VR player is the monster and everyone else is the hunter. Interesting. 
Yeah, I like the I like the party game aspect because uh, our VR, whenever we have guests over and they see it. So I, and when you came over for your podcast, I showed it to you sitting on the wall. Um, uh, I 3D printed off of Thingiverse uh, just a, a Quest uh, Quest 2 VR wall mount. Right. So it holds and it actually hides. So you can't see the mount behind the actual vr so it looks like the vr is just floating on my wall and so are the controllers the controllers are mounted to the same thing so when that thing gets a lot of attention in the living room when people come in they're like oh man you've got vr and oh you've got the new one the wireless one um and we let everybody play it it's kind of I mean, luckily like i know we we always cast whatever they're playing onto the tv in the living room so everyone can see what they're seeing but they are they're in their own world because the speakers on the headset or on the actual oculus is it's so loud it's crazy how the, it, it's really well done how loud oh, the yeah. speakers on the oculus actually is to you as the user but to everyone else in the room like you really can't hear it you can see what's on the tv i can listen to what's happening on the tv and it doesn't interfere with you playing with the oculus so i think that was extremely well done uh, to say the least from a from an engineering standpoint. Uh, oh yeah. Especially the but fact you're still that, alone. Uh, sorry. I said, but, but you're still, you're still playing alone. Right. So right, yeah. Everyone else is kind of sitting on the couch, just watching you swing your arms around. And the joke is, can I go get my, the cookies and milk off the counter over here without getting punched with my wife, <laughs> yeah. my, my wife squarely punched my butt, uh, one of my buddies in the face. He had came up to help her. And he was like, okay, here, I'm going to, he was trying to tighten the, the strap on her arm. He had just given her the, the controllers. And then she's like, oh, okay, wait. And then she picks up a paper airplane and she goes to throw the paper airplane. And she just broadsided him in the side of the head <laughs> with the controller. <laughs> that sounds about right. <laughs> <laughs> it's but, always the person yeah. that goes up to help too. It, it, it is every time. Of it. <laughs> so, um, oh, geez, what I just do? Here we go. Um, so, but for but for you, here we go. So, uh, little pine, I hope that answers your question because I actually had never even I never heard of that. I never even considered is there a game with one VR and multiple PC players? Uh, so, actually, let me ask you this. So, have you been seeing all of these like haptic uh, devices for gaming? I am ex extremely interested in this technology uh, i wanted to be one of the early kickstarters for it but i found the kickstart after it had already ended um it looks like uh like a like a like a a, a flotation vest almost for like like when you go like bass fishing and you've got the really really tiny life-saving device that like inflates once you actually fall in the water and you pull the cord and stuff but they use speakers they use like high-powered subwoofers essentially that are really tiny but they put them all over like your chest you uh, they put them on your chest and your back and your waist and stuff um and when and when you're playing like a first person shooter and you get hit in the game the speaker will actually just you know emit a frequency it'll emit a, a sound wave but because it's such a low frequency wave you can physically feel it and it'll hit you like a gunshot, but you're playing in your basement. So I I want one of these things so bad. They're like fifteen hundred bucks right now for the good one. There's two big companies that are currently pursuing it, and I think they have gotten pretty far with it. It's still not there. It's like you said, it's still got some time to where that becomes a household item, just like the Oculus is, you know, starting to become more popular. Oh yeah. But um, as far as gaming tech those haptic vests are super interesting to me, especially that is what would get me into VR more than anything is, you know, how realistic can I make this game? Um, and then the second thing, I don't know if you've seen it, but they have these like, uh, whoops, they have, they have these dishes that you stand in. It's like a satellite dish and you, they either have rollers, like, like almost like tiny little rolling balls, or you just wear socks and you can actually run in the dish and the the it tracks your feet or you can be wearing a hip like device 
And depending on the tension of the cords, it tells where you're running. It tells if you're crouching, if you're standing. It's it's ridiculous how in how in depth this stuff is getting. Oh yeah, and I I, I feel like to the haptic vest uh, idea, I feel like the main you know strength of VR is just immersion, and anything you can do to increase immersion is just going to make the entire experience better. As for uh, like those treadmills, uh, that actually is going to help to fix um, some of that like simulation sickness that you mentioned earlier. Where yeah, uh, I think the 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 term used is locomotion. So okay, if you can have true one to one locomotion, so you know if I move a foot and it tracks that I moved a foot in the game, then yeah, my my eyes and my inner ear they're completely fine. They're working together at this point. Right. They're synced up properly. Right. Which means I can play longer, which means people can make experience that'll or experiences that will last longer. And you know, everyone will be happy. Yeah. That I like that. I, I hope that becomes the norm. Uh, it's all of these, like you said, these immersive uh, accessories to this, uh, to the VR and to gaming. Um, right. I, I mean, like it, how- it's, it's one of those things where like it's always going to be the hardware is not there yet but it's always in more specific areas like i remember um did you ever go to disney quest as a kid disney quest i don't think so so this was a place that was in uh it was at walt disney world in orlando but it's essentially a giant arcade and it oh was... yes sorry yeah no you're good uh it was built like in the mid to late 90s and they had vr there but it was like 90s vr and literally the hardware issue is that these headsets are like 50 pounds so like <laughs> i can't i can't wear this without like having this big harness hold it up for me and now we're at the point where it's like you know it'd be nice if i could like feel it when i get shot <laughs> but you know what? i feel like we're i feel like we're on track i think we're gonna be okay y'all yeah here we go. Austin Connell just commented. He brings up a good point. Um, or uh, not a good point, but a, a good idea. I could only imagine a racing simulator in VR with haptic feedback. Yeah. So yeah. actually, um, I'm very glad, Connell, that you popped in here. So the, this guy in the comment, first off, this is a true friend here sticking out till 930 at night on a live stream <laughs> uh, uh, to, su- to support my show. Um this guy right here in the comment was the person to get me into VR. So he has the full, I forget what setup it is. Comment Austin. If you want to let me know what was the exact VR that you had, but his had the cords everywhere. So you, you were range limited, but he also had like the sensors around that set up his space. And he was a huge racing simulator uh, guy with the VR. And I could not for the life of me while we were in college, I could not, race a single game more than like four to five minutes that was it i couldn't i was so nauseous from it and then this was the most genius thing he takes his fan he takes his little like space fan he sticks Mm -hmm. it in front of my seat blowing air at me as if i have wind blowing past me as when i'm driving solved it i could race for 15 20 minutes at a time it was oh yeah it was absolute like and that right there that's in Tell me if I'm using the term incorrectly, but that's haptic feedback right there. Technically, oh, yeah. I, mean, I don't know if it's like feedback, but it, it's a haptic environment that, yeah, I'm getting the wind in my hair and in the wind in my face as I'm driving a car. My ears and my eyes are syncing up together a little bit. Oh, here we go. Yeah. So he says he has an Oculus Rift. Okay. Oh, yeah. Um, no, I've got one of those on my bookshelf right now. Oh, cool. that's actually what I was using a couple of years back. And it's like, there's, for me, it was too much equipment. And now that we have standalone stuff, that's all I want to use. <laughs> but no like yeah. Oculus Rift that's a that's a good model yeah it, and this was ooh I don't know 2016 2017 when he got me into this yeah that, that's about and when I got into it so um, yeah I, I'm excited so as far as a haptic feedback for racing I'm trying to think of like what what could we do other than like those crazy like you know multi-axis um those big multi-axis racing sim systems that you could go get at like uh oh, what is it uh 
oh, what's the electric racing cart place down in Marietta? Oh, Andretti's. Right next, Andretti's, yeah. So they've got that yeah. really big uh, simulator. Here we go. Here we go, Austin again. Uh, we need to link the vehicle speed to the game and a potentiometer to control this fancy. There you go. That's actual haptic feedback. I think I right? also have I like... a potentiometer on that bookshelf, too, so we could probably hack this out by tonight. Oh, maybe you yeah. can hack this out tonight. I just learned that. <laughs> yeah, no, me, I I only just learned how to control a potentiometer in Arduino like <laughs> recently. <laughs> so um, I may not be the guy for the job here, but um, I can I can 3D print whatever housing you want to put all your stuff in. So, <laughs> <laughs> Sounds but good. that would that would be awesome. I mean, okay, so let me let me ask you this: How difficult actually would that be for you to? build some kind of like plugin that when you're playing a racing game that it can con that it can communicate to some kind of i don't know raspberry pi or arduino or a combo of the two to control a little fan for fan speed to where we could do what connell here is talking about i mean as far like, as like scale me one to ten software, uh, if we're talking like me setting up the software just to send the signal to uh, a microcontroller like that probably somewhere around one or two it's pretty oh, okay. easy to do yeah if it's something like hey you know we're just going to go between zero and one based on this thing's speed we know the max speed is going to be i don't know 90 miles an hour so right if you're going 45 miles an hour crank it up to 0.5 now when we get into the electrical engineering aspect that's when it's going to get a little bit more difficult for me <laughs> but so we've got multitudes of different skilled and faceted engineers in the local engineer community here. So I legitimately think we could do this. And you know what? I think we should, you know, so I mean, here yeah. it is in, in the universe. You just started this. Thank you, Austin. Like I need another project, but um, <laughs> I, <laughs> I've also got, I've got you here to program it. I've got Austin, who's the racing sim guy. And then I've got another couple guys that are actual, you know, EEs or electrical engineers. Um, we can actually try to make this. We should make a video. Like a, we could do a full, you know, YouTube video on making a haptic fan racing fan for your racing sims and see what yeah, we can do with it. So, all right. If anybody else is down, uh, oh, here we go. What did he just comment? He commented a lot. Uh, Austin Connell just commented back. Lots of sim. Oh, let me try. Here we go. Lots of sim racers have the game parameters pretty accessible since sim guys tend to get wild with adding all sorts of gauges, buttons, etc. Yeah, I, I agree. Um, so I'm pretty sure. All right. If you're confident that we can do this, I'm confident that we can do this. Um, I can definitely help with the mechanical side and some electrical. I know basic circuitry, um, but I'm definitely not an EE. It's not my major. I don't. The, the magic flowing throughout the ether is not my, you know, forte. So, but right. I'll get someone who is and shoot, man, we'll just, we'll figure out how to do this. Um, so, all right, well, we put it out there. We're going to do it. We'll just figure <laughs> out when we can do it. So, oh, and you know what? That's actually kind of great because, uh, so for those of you that are, that are still here, which thank you for being here for the full hour. It, it means a lot. Um, as we get this show off the ground, uh, Tony here was talking about actually starting his own channel. So what better content to try to start with than, you know, hook and then meeting up with a bunch of other local engineers to create a haptic VR system or just a, a haptic VR devices. So this might be your first, this might be one of your first pieces of content. I have no idea, but I mean, this is going to be a big step for first piece of content, but I'm not going to say no. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, that's called collaboration is always I'm, good, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Here we go. We got another one from a uh, little pine cone. How would a game like call of duty and, and new items? I think he means add. How would a game like call of duty add new items into the experience? Ex uh, that's what I'm going with experience uh, so. such as guns and maps. So trying to decipher this question here. Um, but how would they add? So I wonder if he's talking about just like basic updates. Uh, so let's go with that. So when, as a game design engineer, when you were making an update to it, when you're making an update to a game, some of these I'm like, I don't want to touch, right? I'm like, I just want to play my game. I don't want to deal with anything. I just want to go. 
Um, right. Especially when like it's like a huge, but some of them make perfect sense. Like like big map packs that are like 80, 100 gigabytes, right? You, mm-hmm. And if you don't download them, you physically cannot play on them. I get that. Um, but as far as adding new content onto the side, so uh, you know, like you said, new guns, new maps, new vehicle skins and stuff like that, how easy or how difficult is that as a design engineer or game engineer? So it's going to depend largely on how uh, this has already been architected out. So if they already had a plan for, oh, we're definitely going to, you know, in six months, add like this many like guns or this many maps or whatever, uh, there's probably already some sort of, some kind of pipeline already set up so that really all they have to do is they just have to make sure everything is ready, have it in some kind of package that they know the game will recognize and then send it up to the server. The server will say, oh, hey, we have new content. We're gonna tell everyone who is connected to this server that they need to update and download this thing. And then once it's downloaded on their end, it usually it's something as simple as there's already some list of this is every single, I'll, I'll use guns for the example. This is every single gun in the game. All they're doing is saying, cool, and now we're adding these two or three to the very end of that list. So gotcha. everything should still play nicely because everything else is just basing off of, hey, we're just going to build things based off what this list says. Gotcha. At least that is how I would make it. So I assume that's <laughs> probably on the right track. There's probably going to be someone listening to this later saying, nah, that's totally wrong, bud. <laughs> Yeah, it's a it, so and and going with that, if uh, if someone else out here it, that it that stumbles upon this either towards the end of this live stream or down the road after this is published to YouTube, if you are a video game engineer or a game design engineer and you have some other things you'd like to uh, to add in, uh, you know, head over to the localengineer.com or head over to our Facebook page and send us a message. We love learning about new technologies. Um, and we also like, of course, if we say something that was just flat out incorrect, you, you know, uh, we we all learn here, you know, none of us are proven to be experts, but we are professionals in our field. So, um, if we have something that we can improve on, absolutely let us know. I like, like I said, I love learning new things and I love learning when I wasn't right. <laughs> so I don't do it again. So, um, but I solo pinecon. I hope that answered that question. Otherwise, I apologize if I butchered it. Um, so, um, all right. So now getting into some of the games that you have developed, let's get into those. Can can you talk about what you've been doing at Tasty Pill, or what came, sure. what kind of games are you guys working on? I should say. So a lot of our stuff right now is definitely going to be more of the you know, arcadey kind of just like like hyper casual games. So stuff where right. it's really just one or two main mechanics. So for example, uh, I know one of the projects I'm working on is, you know, the way you control the character is if you hold the, your finger on the screen, they're going to move. And if you swipe either to the left or the right side of the screen, that's where they're going to go. Um, okay. And they're just running through an obstacle course, essentially. and what we do is we just try to make it so that experience just feels as good as possible. And then we'll make sure that the levels really don't last more than maybe 20 seconds. So the idea is that you can get through um, just a lot of levels fairly quickly and you'll have a good time. And you know we'll also make sure that you have some uh, like some skins or some kind of unlocks to you know work toward because we know that some players, while they do like just the actual challenge aspect of it, some really also just like to collect things. And so right. we want to make sure that we appeal to everyone. Absolutely. Yeah, one of my favorite. And tell me where this lies on the hyper-casual spectrum. One of my favorite like mobile apps when I used to play games, I really don't. I genuinely don't play mobile games. I have not played mobile games for several years now. Um, even my iPad, I got that for college. I, the only game on that is puzzles and that is, that's not even for me. That's when my wife takes my iPad, she plays puzzles. on it. Um, so, but when I did play games, when I was like in high school and whatnot on my phone, 
Um, Angry Birds, absolute favorite game. I love the physics of it. I love trying to figure out all of that. And then same thing along those lines was like that cut the rope game. Um, those were my two favorite. So what, where do those stand? Like, what would you classify those? Are those uh, hyper casual games or those casual or those physics casual? Like, what would you call that as? See, I, I feel like if those were made today, they would be called hyper casual. Uh, I feel like back when they were made though, they were definitely more just considered casual games or even really just phone games. Um, oh, wow. Okay. And it's funny too, because thinking about like how they would have been made today, uh, I know for this isn't true for all hyper casual games, but I do know for you know a good portion of them, not just the ones my company make, uh, we use what's called procedural generation. So, you know, the actual level structure, we we're not hand building that. We basically just set up an algorithm saying, here's about what this level should have based on where they are in the game. And so that way, you know, if I play level 10 and you play level 10, we both effectively played two different levels. Now they both might have like, it's like, oh, did you fight the red guy? It's like, yeah, well, we, we made sure the red guy is going to be in level 10, but actually getting to him and getting at, away from him, completely different. Interesting. Um, I feel like, uh, I feel like those games would definitely incorporate it more. I know that was like a big draw for Angry Birds was that a lot of these levels were handcrafted. And so that's what made that's what made it feel a little bit more uh more fair, I want to say, or unfair depending on how far you're getting into the game. Uh because you know, okay, someone someone put this together and so looking at what I have as far as like here are the birds that they let me use for this level there's some combination here that's going to work because right. someone designed this to be solved. Um, and of course, that's also something that could be nefarious too, is if you use procedural generation in this way, it's like you could potentially make a level that is not winnable. Um, I think there's actually, uh, I think some puzzle games got into hot water a couple years back about that, if I remember correctly, where it's something huh. like, Hey, this is basically skewed to the point where like you have to play this level 20 times before you can actually get a level that is winnable. And of course, every time you lose, you get served an ad. So it's like, this is, uh, <laughs> this seems a little bit in bad faith. I don't, I don't know if I want to keep playing this game. Oh, that's funny. Yep. Make it so hard that you pay an ad revenue for the person playing the free game at the end oh it's it's genius and cruel at the same time yeah it's you know funny enough uh i remember this might have been battlefield 3 or maybe even bad company 2 when uh that first came out they had like some kind of pass where it's like hey do you want to just have every gun and every attachment give us 20 dollars yeah and i was like that's stupid no one would ever pay for that and then like 10 years later it's like (laughs) no that's just that's just how we play it now you yeah. don't really get the option. <laughs> I, I, I remember. Oh my goodness! I remember seeing that. Um, I would be working my tail off trying to get to whatever it was, whatever level, and I'd see someone who's like a level five with the same gun that's at the very end of the list. I'm like, well, I, at first I'd be like, well, I don't like it. I'm okay with it because. I bought this game. I paid sixty dollars or something for this game to play to have fun. If you put an extra twenty bucks in, what's an extra twenty bucks to have more fun in the game you're already in? Right. So, and I, I, I see both sides of it. I see there are people who have more time than money. And it's like well, they would rather just grind it, or grind through the game, and just get all of it themselves. Yeah. There's people too who it's like I don't have a lot of time to play games. I don't want to be playing an experience that is not what I want because the gun I want, I have to, you know, get through 50 levels before I can even get to it. Right. So yeah, yeah, here's 20 bucks. Let me get my gun, please. I remember. uh, And so, and then there's the ones where you can only, these ones were always the most fun, but because they were so difficult to like organize to get, but once you got it, it was like, 
oh my oh everybody look at me i got this uh, i actually i distinctively remember i forget i forget which battlefield it was i want to say it was battlefield four um you had everybody you, there was a certain way you could get this like crossbow as as your primary weapon uh mm-hmm. or as like a ex, or as an accessory weapon or something the only way you could get it is if you were running around a few select maps and then randomly throughout the game only one like piece of like intel or something would be scattered somewhere across the map you just had to find it and it wasn't somewhere where you would regularly be going it'd be like on this rock way over here outside of like the most uh, outside of the hot zones of the map and it got to that's where really i saw like the whole easter egg community start really developing People were building websites that were dedicated to tracking where these little pieces of intel would pop up. Um, they would record like the times. They would record what maps uh, had different cycles. If there were any patterns as to, like, okay, well, we see this pattern of it. This spawns at A, B, C, and D in this order at these times when these are played with these other. It's just like I thought I I had no time, or I took I took I played I put but way too much time into the game. These people were running circles around me while I'm complaining about how much time I'm putting into a game. But the Easter egg sense was just something that I think was ex- an extremely genius stroke towards the game or, or, or an aspect of the game, I should say, because it didn't cost me anything, but it, it sent me on a journey. I was on, I was looking on web. I was looking on, Easter egg hunting websites. I was looking at, uh, and I'm still all in this one ecosystem, right? Like you were saying, I'm in this one game, um, and I can't buy this thing, but I'm going to put the time into it to get it. I might buy some other things to help me get to that point, but you can't buy this accessory. There's no way to get it other than you either find it laying on the ground from somebody else, or um, you find this little piece of intel you find four other people that have a, that also have a piece of intel. You go to this one map with this one elevator that opens one time during the game, and then all four of you go down in there, and then you can get in. But if one of you doesn't have the piece of intel locked or unlocked, then everyone in the elevator dies. So it's like yeah, and you have to play with other people. You cannot accomplish this mission on your own. Um. So from a, I don't know, I kind of, I, I just, I literally just, you said something and it just kind of popped into my head as to like how involved in the game are you, are you willing to go? And these people are figuring it out how to either may, offer you an out where you can pay for it or uh, for people like you and me who like to enjoy the grind of accomplishing something that that absolutely extraneous task or all these extraneous tasks to get this one thing accomplished was absolutely worth it. And then in the end they unlocked it for everybody. So yeah, <laughs> here like, we go. Someone can play loud enough. Right. Um, here you go. How do you feel about flying games that are PC that are PC and VR accessible? Um, so this is one thing that I have yet to dive into. I have Microsoft Flight Simulator. Um, I play it. So I would say that's the game I've actually been playing the most, and I still don't play that often. Um, I have yet to plug in my VR. I just haven't. Have you? Oh, uh, is like the Oculus Link stuff? Yeah. Or, uh, I mean, I did it earlier today, but that was because I was developing stuff on it. But, um, no, I haven't really played. I haven't really played anything through Oculus Link, but from what I understand, it would be as if I was playing with an an Oculus Rift. Which I mean, I, I have Rift games, so I assume those would work. Um, as far as flying games, I I had a game called Elite Dangerous, which was supposed to be like a space flying kind of sim game, and um, you know that one handled pretty well right up until. Uh, I went like I inverted, went upside down, and then I was like, "I have to get this off. I'm going to throw up right now," because <laughs> uh, it it was so it's such a surreal experience where 
you know, your your eyes are saying you're upside down, and literally every other part of you is saying, "No, you're not. <laughs> Something's wrong." <laughs> um, that's crazy that we have developed a technology that, I mean, le- legitimately just screws with your senses this way. Oh, yeah. I find that to be amazing. And then we intentionally buy it and subject right. ourselves to do it <laughs> and think we, I, oh no, I won't vomit. I'll be okay. Yeah. Well, I, I remember this anecdote where someone once said that, uh, you know, really all books are is we just, you know, pummeled trees down and then wrote r- random squig- uh, squiggles on it. And every time we look at it now, we just hallucinate. <laughs> it's like, I mean, We've been doing this for years, really. Yeah. But no, as far as like uh, how I feel about them, I think that uh, I think that they do have a, a good like spot here. I think VR is really a good place for simulator type games. That said, as far as the flying aspect, um, it's like what I was saying with simulation sickness. That's going to be the biggest hurdle. And for some people, it is not a big deal. And for some people, it is a huge deal where you know they they can't really play with that kind of um that kind of stress on their body, and so I I yeah. feel like they're going to have to find a way to either either mitigate that or just completely sidestep it for it to really be more of a uh, of a welcoming genre for VR. As far as PC, it's like yeah you you know you're playing a game that's on a screen so doing those kind of maneuvers <laughs> right you should be fine right although shoot um, now that i think about it um did you ever play squadrons i think that came out last year didn't it the star I, wars i bought it i have yeah. it i haven't opened it, it hey as, man you're good i think i got it on like sounds. playstation plus and i still haven't played it yet so it's I, all i got it on good, black friday sale i was like it was like eleven dollars or something it was normally like 50 i was like whatever all right i'm buying it because so many people had talked about it and then i heard that there is a way that i can use my oculus quest twos and play squadrons and i'm again i'm a huge star wars fan so anything i can feel like star wars i'm in whenever i go to disney world and i see that all like the costumes are for little kids they don't actually sell them for adults i'm always like kind of hurt i'm like hey man i would totally buy this x-wing jacket right now if you made it big enough for me and right, not yeah. your balls. <laughs> hey, we could do that. We could make our own full size, like adult X Wing jackets and then put haptic devices in them and then play squadrons together in VR. That's not a bad idea, actually. <laughs> so what were I'll you doing to... with VR? You were saying you were developing VR earlier. Yeah, so I'm really just trying to get my uh my feet wet with uh just making VR stuff. Uh, I would really like to, uh, you know, just do more of that in general. Um, so far, it, it's really just been making Unity and my Oculus Quest just play nice together, which uh, I think I spent about 30, 45 minutes after work today just trying to get them to not, like, basically, if I plug it into my computer, all I get is a black screen on my Oculus. It's like, can I not have that, though? <laughs> and eventually I figured out what the issue is, but, uh, or issue was, but, you know, it, it's slow going, but that's, that's usually how it goes whenever you're messing with the new technology. But, uh, yeah, I, I, yeah. I just like to try making stuff, you know? That's awesome. It's just, I mean, that's how I sound like now I'm seeing the other side of the spectrum here where I'll say, oh yeah, I just, I'll just build stuff in my garage or yeah, I made that. What, what's the big deal? And then people look at me like, oh, man, you're so smart. I'm like, the smart is a relative word, people. <laughs> um, you know, so I hear you say, oh, yeah, I'm just developing my own VR stuff. I'm over here like jaw drop. Like, uh, that's awesome. I, you're extremely smart to me <laughs> if you're able to just do that. Um, so that's awesome, though. Um, so as far as and, and so we are rolling up here. So I think we have time for one more question slash topic and then uh and then we'll sign off for the evening um which by the way dude thank you for coming on this live stream uh i guess uh, like i said everybody else we have a full uh podcast episode with tony here uh it is not live yet it is it's in the queue i have a few others in front of him that i got to get out before 
Um, and his is actually going to be a video podcast. So we'll see how this goes. Um, so stay tuned for his episode on Spotify, Apple Podcasts, YouTube, everywhere. It's going to be, you're not going to be able to miss it. So, but uh, we will be definitely having you on more often. Uh, this is, I love, I love talking about this, especially once Battlefield 2042 actually gets released. I think we'll have more kind of like, hey, did you see this aspect in the game? What do you think of this? What, how difficult is it? Is, I don't know. The, the tornadoes that go through the game and stuff like that. Um, how, right. how effective are those? And, you know, we'll be able to play a little more and shoot. Maybe we'll actually just play something together and we can live stream us playing. So um, here we go. All right, Little Pinecone, you have the last question of the show. Uh, a qu- with a quick explanation, how do hackers get into video games? And how do people hack in video games? This is a great question. I personally also would like to understand how this works. I've seen these videos where uh, these, you know, very, whatever, these Twitch streamers are playing. And then they accidentally, while they're streaming, they click on their cheat bot that they have. That's like helping them see people through the map and stuff. Um, right. And then they lose everything because they were caught. They basically showed themselves cheating. Um, yeah it's like not only do you get kicked out of the game you also get kicked out of twitch it's like that's just a double whammy at that point but right which i probably shouldn't have cheated good exactly right um which i i had always i mean i remember when at one point like the hackers were really bad in like uh call of duty and then they were really bad in battlefield and now they're just Man, they are everywhere. You cannot escape them. Uh, PUBG was terrible. I stopped playing because I couldn't just. I would. I would watch what would happen. This guy would literally just be spinning around, from like on the absolute other side of the map, and I would just. It was. It was so unpleasant to play, um, for for that exact reason. It's like I get it. If someone's better than me, fine, whatever. Um, it is what it is. I got. I got to get better. I got to not suck, and I'll. I'll last longer <laughs> in the game. So, but yeah, how do hackers get with the, like, I don't even understand how you hack, right? Is it really hacking or is it just you, you paid, you bought something like what is the cheating? What is cheating in a video game? Let's just go with that. Uh, so, man, what is cheating? Sorry. That, that may been really a deep. terrible question. I meant, <laughs> let me rephrase that. Like what? That was just what a very deep this? question for me. I was just like, man, what? <laughs> What really is cheating, though? No, so uh, I guess just a quick explanation on hacking. Uh, hacking is really, in the broadest sense, this is you know this works for video games. This works for hacking into websites. Anything you're just trying to find a weakness and then you're exploiting it. So in the case of video games, so for things like wall hacks or um, aim bots, things like that you're essentially, you found a way to override something that the game is sending to the server to skew it more in your favor. So for things like aimbots, you're basically saying, hey, I know I didn't hit that guy in the head, but we're gonna tell the server I hit him in the head because I know that instantly kills him and then I win because of that. So, uh, yeah, there are a ton of companies that do make money off of this, unfortunately. And so what they do is they just spend their time trying to find these exploits and then they'll sell them to other people. Now, usually whenever you get like a random update or a random patch in a game that doesn't really seem to add anything, usually if you ever see uh, the line fix uh, stability issues, it usually means, hey, we're just plugging some holes so some hackers can't. Uh, do what they've been doing for the past week or so. Gotcha. Um, I want to say there was another one I was thinking of. Um, I mean, I remember back in the day with uh, lag switching. Uh, yes. Did you ever run into that back in the day? Yes. Uh, man, it was so infuriating. So do you know what was causing that? Like, no, why that I worked? don't. Nope. I just uh, knew the turn and then I was always the victim of it. So back in the day, I think this was before like Modern Warfare 2, um, there was a, the server was set up differently. Instead of being a dedicated server where there's just one server that everyone connects to, it was peer to peer. 
So one person was the the host of the game. So everyone had to connect to that person to play off of like them. Huh. And so what someone would do if they had the lag switch is essentially you just have a uh, some way to just cut your router off for a second so that you can do stuff and uh, your packets get backed up. So like the signals you're sending to the server, you know, just kind of stack up behind each other. It's like, okay, well, we're going to keep holding these because we might talk to the server again in a second and we need to give them all this info. So you do that for a second, flip it back on, and now the server is getting all of this data back to back. And so it's trying to compensate for that. And that's why, like, you know, I'm just going to turn this off. I'm going to knife him. Cool. Turning it back on. <laughs> Even if the guy is on the other side of the map at this point, the server is still saying, oh, hey, this guy actually died. So we need to, we need to remove him from the game. So, yeah. and that's basically what happened. And then, yeah, it's like you said, Usually I was the one getting knifed, so it wasn't a great experience for me, but, you know, at least I learned something, yeah. so that was yeah, fun. Yeah, that's interesting. That was so, – I, uh, I, I remember that. I remember the lag switching. I remember uh, on the actual controllers, people would have those buttons that would essentially spam the – that would spam the game and say, oh, hey, he's throwing, you know, or he's shooting 100 rounds in a split second, you know, instead oh, yeah. of actually – you know, I forget what that what what that was actually called, but uh, um, oh, but yeah, I remember people were paying like stupid money for these Xbox controllers with these extra buttons on the bottom that were oh, yeah, like the elite controllers? controllers. No, no, no. The um, oh, what's the? I forget the name of it, but it, it was specifically for cheating. It was ne- it was only one button. It wasn't the elite controls where you can like actually have all these extra paddles and use legitimate. Mm-hmm features in the game that are given to you these these buttons you would press it when you were shooting and it would basically magically give you 10 times the amount of rounds per actual round fired so that way you only had to pull the trigger like once on a sniper rifle but the guy got hit with like 10 rounds so it was an inst it was an insta kill it just no there was no way you could escape it um and you would hear it you would hear the guy go bang but then on your character it would be like pow 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 and you're like what how there, there's only one round this shouldn't be happening so yeah, it's I like re- this guy's hitting I... me with a 50 caliber it shouldn't be going that fast <laughs> so i remember those um and then but yeah just the aim bots the aim bots that let you aim through the uh, especially when, when you were in like battlefield i had to quit flying i couldn't fly a plane because everybody that was flying a plane was running an aimbot and it was yeah. the most infuriating thing i'm over here like actually trying to fly these dang planes and this guy's pointing over here and in mid-flight he's somehow hitting me i'm like he's not even pointing at me how am i being hit by this so yeah it, it, i de- i can't stand the cheaters i have zero sympathy for people who cheat in anything, let alone a little, you know, stinking video game, which is just for fun. So I definitely love seeing the the uh, consequences <laughs> that get brought on, like these Twitch streamers that are cheating, and then they go, "Oh no, I lost everything because I cheated in yeah, front like, of everybody." This, so I had this great job, and then uh, I decided to cheat, and now I don't. Yeah, and there's another one. I gave up on place. He was actually one of the best pilots ever when we were in battlefield i would always be the tail gunner because i i couldn't fly i could I mean, that's I could, when you know he's I a good pilot because no one wants to be a tail gunner yeah yeah he would he would just fly all over the place man we would go we would go for a long time and just wreak havoc so but yeah it was the same thing it was just it got to a point where you know even having a tail gunner you couldn't defeat these aim bots so but well, thank you, Little Pinecone, for the question there about hackers and video games and stuff. I think that's a much deeper topic, too. So we definitely can have this conversation. We can continue on this on another episode for sure. But um, we, we've been on here. Holy cow, dude. We've been here for an hour and a half. It doesn't know, feel right? like it. Um, so 
Thank you, everybody, for tuning in this evening. This is a weekly Wednesday live stream. So uh, every Wednesday night at 8.30 Eastern, we're going to have a live stream with some guests. So, um, And last week, we had to cancel. We, had a, we, we did have a family emergency, so I do apologize that we didn't have that live stream. Um, and now we're, you know, backed up. So um, next week's guest uh, should, should be the one that we had to cancel this Wednesday. So stay tuned for him. Um, and then this weekend, we have a total of four podcasts we're recording. So this studio is going to be packed. Um, well, I say packed, like only one person at a time. But, you know, every every booking is clear it's crazy dude like i'm excited that you're here with me this early on with the show uh especially for the live stream um and thank you to everybody here in the comments throughout the evening that was fielding us good questions you know i started this show because i want to be able to ask people like you these kind of questions and some i can't think of everything but i always have i always have things in the back of my mind whenever i'm doing anything that i wish i knew how blank worked right so um again everybody see you guys next week uh with our next guest bring your questions bring your curiosity and we'll get everything answered as best as we can so uh tony thank you for coming on if anybody wanted to reach out to you about video game engineering and game designing uh how could they reach you yeah so i'm on both twitter and instagram under uh big tony barrett so uh tony barrett yeah, there, there's a story behind that name that I'm not going to get into <laughs> right now. <laughs> uh, so, all right, everybody, you heard it. Big Tony Barrett, Twitter and Instagram. Go give him a follow, um, especially for when he gets his channel up and running. Uh, we're definitely going to help you push that, dude, because I'm excited for whatever it is we do, especially when we do this uh, haptic air system for racing games. I think you, made, you said it was a level one difficulty out of 10. So... I think we need to do this and then we just have it on YouTube. We can show people how to do it. This will be awesome. So um, until next time, everybody, thank you all for coming out. Bye all.